in the next hour. Uh, this event is being recorded and we'll be posting the recording to our YouTube channel. So um, that's our San Jose State, S-A-A-S-C, YouTube. So this event was inspired by Ask an Archivist Day. So I don't know if you've seen this on Twitter, um, but you can ask what you want to know about archives and um, archivist careers. So we decided to try doing a, an in-person or in Zoom person version um, with our panel that we have today. Let me tell you more about our panel. We have Nikki Thomas. She's an archivist for collection management at University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And um, within SAA, she is the co-chair of the Committee on Ethics and Professional Conduct. She's a co-chair of the Diverse Sexuality and Gender Section and a member of the National Best Practices for Archival Exciting Working Group. Lolita Rowe is joining us. She's the university, Assistant University Archivist for Outreach and Engagement at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's also a project manager for the SAA podcast, Archives in Context, and an award-winning creator, host, and the co-producer for two podcasts, Rose Library Presents Community Conversations and Rose Library Presents Behind the Archive. And Aaron Bauckham is the Associate Professor and Digital Archivist at University of Montana. Her areas of specialization include sustainable, accessible, born digital, born digital preservation, and ju justice, equity, di diversity, and inclusion-based content description. She is also a chair of the Diversity Committee at SAA. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and our first quest, set of questions are kind of about starting out in an archival, archival career. And Ellie Phelps, our um, club se secretary, is going to ask these questions. Okay, thanks, Katrina. And thank you to our panelists for being here. This is so invaluable to get your insight on all these questions. So the first question that we have is, what is the best way to enter an archival career? And anybody can just answer. You just want one of us to jump in? Yes, whoever feels uh, comfortable. Okay. I mean, 15 years ago, I would have told you to go to library school. And now I would say, start doing something. Mm -hmm. um, don't volunteer, get paid labor somewhere, but, um, or work on a community project, a community archiving or oral history project, just to kind of see what the environment's like, um, what types of archiving you might be interested in, who you'd want your future colleagues to be what your values are in the in the profession. Um, I did it the other way. I went to library school and thought I wanted to be a public librarian, um, which is a bad personality fit for me, uh, but uh, found archives. Yeah, my nice. answer would be half, oh, sorry, Lolita. <laughs> my answer would be okay. half privilege, <laughs> like we just saw. Um, honestly, I did it the same way Nikki did. I went to library school because I had a history degree and my mother asked me what you do with that. Um, so my undergrad degree was in history. I had a really strong background in computer science. And so I went to library school and fell into digital archiving just through my um, experience and job opportunities as a student. Um, I got my first position, which is still my position as a tenured professor at the University of Montana. Um, because I had privilege. I had the ability to kind of wait it out and I got good internships. Um, there are more community archiving opportunities now than there were six years ago. So if you can gain your experience that way, when you see those kind of job ads that are like two to four years experience and you're going, what the hell? Um, there's more opportunities for that in community archiving than there ever was before. <laughs> I went a completely different route. I still went to library school, but I went four years undergrad as a biology major. Because mm -hmm. even though I loved history, I'm like, what can I get a job with that degree with? And mm -hmm. um, then went to the public library, liked that for a little bit, and then went to academic libraries. And um, every time somebody told me I should be a librarian or an archivist, I told them, why would I want to be in that profession? <laughs> and yet here I remain. So when <laughs> I created my podcast um, for Rose Library Presents Behind the Archives, 
I asked people in different professions that same question, like, how did you become? And no one had the exact same answer because this route, like Nikki said, it, it takes different paths. Um, and the great thing is like, yeah, don't do unpaid labor. Um, that's a key role. And I think more archives are realizing that. But I, like Nikki, I thought, well, I want to be behind the scenes, but I realized like I shine more in public services because of the public service experience that I had in the public library. I really like to engage with people. But um, yeah, it's, it's so many winding paths that get you to this point. I had the privilege of working with Lolita. Um, I think she was on the search committee that hired me at my current position. Um, and I know that she was in at least two or three other departments in, a, in the library before she transitioned to special collections mm -hmm. and then stuck around. And you did at least two or three different jobs in our department. Um, somebody in the chat asked why public libraries weren't a good personality fit for me. Um, I need downtime. Mm -hmm. I become like, I can be super social. I'm loud. I'm talkative. But I need recharge time. And I don't think that that's a good, I don't think that a lot of public librarians get that. And I'm not saying that I don't like people. I love working with donors. Um, but I'm not an instruction person. I don't have the patience to sit and walk somebody through how to use a public use terminal and the computer and all of that. I think that I would have been truly unhappy if I had continued um, on the path to, to work in public libraries. Um, I don't think that archives are, you know, like I do work in a basement, but it's not like it's not one of those jobs. You can't just take that for granted. My job has a really good balance between technical back end support and then tons of donor outreach. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, on to the next question. What was your first position in archival work? Okay, I have to start here because it was with Nikki and Lolita. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, my first year as a MILS grad student, so in library school, I was working tech support for the library. Like legit, I'm not even kidding. I was helping them transition to new software in like a super technical way in the back end of the library. My first archives job was at a, as a fellow at UNC Charlotte and halfway through Nikki came on, Lolita was there the entire time and they were so supportive. I mean, the whole team there was amazing, but it was setting up their digital archives program, which hopefully looks completely different now than it did six years ago. But that was my first job and it like kept me in archives, to be honest with you, just the team members and the supportive environment, who you work with matters. And that really shows the further you go along in this profession. I think my, my first role again was at UNC and I was taking over a position that had a very weird name, like archival, it, it was weird. I won't even remember it, but um, it was in the archives in special collections uh, that basically transition to reference and outreach uh, coordinator. And so in that role, it was trying to figure out the social media for the live, for um, the special collections department, uh, dealing with um, reference and being kind of like the second in command at first, because we'd been doing things that were, would be great for a, a public or a reference library, but not for an archives. And so when Nikki came in, we found a better way and a better approach to kind of handle many of the things that we should not have been doing. <laughs> Did um, Lolita and Erin finish? I My Zoom cut out for a bit there. I don't wanna, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the first job in archives. My yes. first, uh, Volunteer experience was during a records organization class in library school at UT Austin. Um, and that's kind of what sort of secured uh, me changing sort of the path that I was taking. My first paid position was as the student archives associate in the archives of American mathematics, the <laughs> Dolph Breno Brisco Center for American History at University of Texas at Austin. Um, so I worked in the math archives um, as she had trouble finding students to work in the math archives because everyone thought they had to do math. Um, as a fellow math team nerd, um, it appealed to me. Uh, it was a great position. It was overfunded as a grant funded position was. I We were reprocessing collections, which is never something you'll do again. Um, 
but it allowed me great um, the opportunity to ask what I like to ask for things I wanted more experience in. And so that's kind of the model I try to bring when, when we have student employees and interns is what else do you want to do? Like build in, build in extra hours, build in extra time so that, you know, you're asking folks what they want experience in because yeah, they might have gotten the job that you're paying them to do, but that might, might not be like all that they want to learn or all that they can learn. Um, but yeah, it was in the math archives. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, yeah, thanks for all those answers. And my last question, why do you wish you had known, what do you wish you had known when you began your first job or internship in archives? This is also another question in the podcast that I, I ask everyone, like what, what like, you know, either like stereotypical things or what would you like to say to someone? One of the things that I, I realized was like, I didn't realize that this position existed, what I do currently. And so <laughs> I tell, I just recently talked to another um, class and I told them the job that you want may not exist yet. So sometimes you have to create it. <laughs> and I wish I had known that because the reason why I didn't want to be in libraries or archives was I thought that I would only have to do one single thing the entire time. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Like every day I come in and it's a, it's a nice wonder of what I have to do. But I wish someone had told me that there's more flexibility. I mean, I'm on a university campus and the amount of faculty don't understand what librarians do when we're on campus with them <laughs> every day. It's mm -hmm. mind blowing. Like, we have one or two catalogers in a library of over 100 employees. We're not, cat nobody's a cataloger anymore. Like, that's not a real job. Like, nobody's called that at all. Um, you know, you might, you're lucky if you have two metadata librarians, you know, at an academic institution the size of the where I am. Um, but yeah, Lolita's job didn't exist when I went to school. Outreach archivist, that's like, what, the last decade? Um, so you can carve out, I mean, I'd... I don't know that anyone would have ever told me this, but you can carve out a niche for yourself. Hmm. Um, you can, where our departments, even in larger institutions are small enough that you can negotiate responsibilities with your colleagues. I mean, I hate instruction. At my last job, I had instruction responsibilities. I knit things for people to trade semesters worth of instruction responsibilities. Like <laughs> we can, you can, you know, you, you balance that with the people around you. You have strengths, they have strengths. So really it's, a lot of times I think it's small departments. And if you're doing your core job functions, there's a lot of flexibility and nobody talks about that. Huh. I would say is that I would kind of piggyback on both Nikki and Lolita and say that do not hyper-specialize. Like, don't take all your electives in one place because I work in a four-person archive. Like, I'm at the University of Montana where the, like, we're the UNC Chapel Hill of Montana, right? We're supposed to be the central first university. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> we have the fewest staff, the fewest hours. I mean, and we're getting the job done because we all have to be kind of jacks of all trade. Mm -hmm. So really pay attention to any kind of practical experience you can get that lets you get experience with reference, get experience with processing, because we need all of that at the jump. And that's why people are saying two to four years of experience. It's because small shops like mine needs you to know or be willing to learn very quickly most aspects of the job because mm -hmm. you don't get to specialize. Like, Six years ago, my job description was quote unquote new, this like digital archivist professionalization specialization, right? And now everybody's expected to know how to do what I do. Hmm. And the digital archivists are kind of just the, the puppet masters in the back doing, you know, procedural development and policy and stuff like that. So don't put yourself in a box and hyper-specialize. Really, really think about the things you enjoy so you can negotiate more of those tasks but don't think that you won't have to quote unquote do reference. Everybody does reference. I don't care what your job is in archives. Everybody does reference. Um, you can probably get out of instruction, but I love teaching grad students. So I kind of hoard those 
instruction sessions. Like, like anytime a grad, a grad group comes through, I'm just like, give them to me. <laughs> I want them. I want to corrupt them. Um, and I'm kind of really privileged in that I'm a unionized tenure track faculty, faculty member. So when I teach, I get to go AWOL. I get to do whatever I want because I will not be penalized for it. So I like really blow their minds with privilege and bias, but went a little far to the left there. But yeah, do not hyper specialize. Looks like there's a follow up question in the chat that says, would you say this applies outside of a university setting? So oh, yes. I'm the one, I mean, it is different. I mean, there's so many of us that are in university settings and or go through university settings despite being in other, you know, types of archives. Um, that is one area where most archivists I know are, that's the specialization. It's the work environment. It's the setting. I have hmm. one colleague that I can think of, and he is at... Um, He's at the San Francisco NARA office now, but he's also been at the Sacramento State History Museum. He's been at the Oakland Museum um, for African-American history, and he's been in a university. We work together at a university, and he's the only archivist I know that's worked at that many different kinds of places, including government archives. Most folks I know stay the course at one particular kind of environment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I saw that one of the questions later on is about that hyper-specialization. Um, and yeah, I don't think, I, I mean, if you're thinking about what's going to make you and make you a well-rounded, like a good candidate, like, and and have more flexibility when you start that job search, it's going to be the breadth of your skills. So like the thing I was talking about earlier when I work with students, and I work with a lot of graduate level interns, and we've had a lot of like, Charlotte doesn't have a library school where I am, but the state of North Carolina has four library programs, including, I think, the only library school at an HBCU. Um, huh. So students have a lot of opportunities who come through um, our university. And we've had a lot of our special collections undergrads go on to library school. And I, the one thing that I really say is, you know, work wherever, work in a public library, work in the law library, work in the math library, work wherever, get like, get in there and figure out what it is that you want to do. Um, we just, I had someone who worked with me and she sent me the most, you know, tear worthy email about how amazing, um, like, and it made me feel amazing to work with her and her husband over the past three or four years doing archive stuff. And she just got an amazing job doing metadata and archiving work at a very small HBCU here in Charlotte, um, Johnson C. Smith University. And it's a position which she was hired for because she had library and archives experience and she'd worked oh. in a business office. So she could do grant administration or at least chip in with grant administration in a library that had two employees before she was hired. So yeah, I think I think do as much as you can. Do as much weird stuff as you can. And I think that to also add on to what Nikki is saying is play to your strengths. If you don't like instruction, don't focus on that. Um, focus on the things that that I hate to say make you happy, but the things that kind of elevate you because there will be somebody there that can take over that. If you don't do instruction, somebody else will. Just make sure that you do reference. If you have good communication skills, if you have good organization skills, those are key components. Those are things that you can transfer into the other things. You're getting the education, get that experience hands-on, like Mickey said, work in any place that you can. Um, sometimes think outside the box, right? And see what could transfer in different areas as well. And we say all this, but, you know, there are plenty of loaner ranger jobs out there, and those are amazing, too. I mean, my first job started out as a temporary loaner ranger job where you do everything from the entire, like, it runs the entire gamut. And that's how you learn what you really like. Like, there are parts of the job. I never thought that working with donors would be something that really, like, I don't know, fills my cup. I can have a horrible <laughs> meeting and then have a meeting with a donor and feel recharged about what my mission is as an archivist. Um, I thought I didn't like the public facing component, but I just don't like the instruction student component. I like the community component. Mm -hmm. There's something about 21 year olds that's 
just difficult for me. <laughs> yeah, Nikki and I are just opposites. I had to fill in as the head of the archives for the last six months, and I was just like, could not wait to give the donors back. But like working with the community, like our student community specifically, and helping student groups figure out their own records management potential, love it. So yeah, we're just opposites. I'm going to invite uh, Katie Burns, our um, club chair, to ask our second set of questions. Katrina, should we just focus on like one or two so we have time to go through all the different sections? Sure. Um, so I guess, what library science courses other than archiving classes did you feel were helpful um, for your current positions? This is the answer I always give. Management and leadership courses. Um, I had an amazing leadership and library course, um, and it's just, it's just a foundational, it's, it's good to know that, you know, like if you're getting your library degree, maybe 15 years ago it was different, but the, the idea that like you wouldn't be managing, that you could potentially just process collections the rest of your life or, you know, catalog books the rest of your life, that's not, that's not what you're going to school for. Um, you know, a lot of people are doing the, the degree just to make that just to be able to like you know make that jump between technician or support staff um and are already qualified for the job that they're going to have after the fact um so yeah acknowledge that you're going to be a manager and you're going to be a leader and and just start learning those sorts of interpersonal skills and figuring out which um which techniques are working going to work for you Yeah, that was one of my favorite classes in, in library school, because again, I didn't think I would go into archives, but that has really served me pretty well on um, learning how to manage not only myself, but programs and projects that I, that I deal with every day. Um, any course that gives you even a remote chance at experiencing what a grant process is like? And that actually happened in my digital preservation course. We had a simulate, simulated grant process. So you can learn the ins and outs of what goes into writing a grant, what a budgeting process for a grant looks like, because we're just, it's going to, you're going to need to know. You're going to either have to help write one, you're going to review one, you're going to have to be part of one as a line item in a budget. So if you can learn pretty early on the ins and outs of how grants work, it will serve you well. Um, and then the other thing I will say that really shot me head and shoulders above was having to do a master's thesis. Um, we didn't have a choice. We had to write a thesis or we say paper because we didn't have a committee, but it's the same thing. Having that simulated public publishing process in the safe environment of a grad school where you were kind of handheld the entire way was super beneficial. So any, it's not just writing a paper, it's that whole process of lit review, data collection, so on and so forth, even though all my data was, quali was qualitative. So those are the two key things. I was gonna say management, but Nikki and Lolita beat me to it. Thanks guys, that's awesome. Um, are there certain topics we should study or get experience in while still working on an MLIS? I guess we kind of, that was sort of similar. Okay, what about what skills do you think are most valuable in an archivist? It's those soft interpersonal skills. I mean, it's really being able to work with patrons, work with your administration, and work with donors in your community, and all of those are different environments. So... I always look on a resume for something like Target, Starbucks. You know, if you've been in a customer service environment of any kind, you have a leg up because references and donor relationships are all customer service. Yeah, I think a lot of archivists get through school without taking reference courses, unfortunately. And so what ends up happening um, instead of sitting down and having these reference interviews with our student, students and like teaching them how to do the skills themselves, we enable them to ask us for stuff forever, to be spoon fed forever. And like, that is one of my soapboxes. Lolita is well aware that I like, I hate just giving the answers to the kids and finding, like I spent weeks creating a finding aid. The least you can do is like keyword search it. Um, but, but yeah, um, those soft skills are always gonna be things. I mean, every job is gonna be political to some extent. 
Yeah, I just agree with what both Aaron and Nikki have said. Like, it's very true. Like, you can have all of these, these like things of like, oh, I have this, this, and this. But if you can't communicate between two people, if you can't um, help, like, instead of sugarcoating, holding the hand of both faculty and students to so like you got to let them go and you got to let them explore they got to be little birdies that you either push from the nest <laughs> or gently tip over the nest because if not you're going to be the person that every department every person is going to ask you and that's going to bog down your day not that you're not being helpful but that is the th those are the things that really like drain you so if you teach someone you teach them how to do it themselves so that the next time they will be um, experts at what they're doing. Kind of piggybacking on what Lolita said, um, the ability to ex assert your own boundaries, um, that's not just archives, that's just a library in general. Um, you mean this whole idea that we should be dedicated to the cause and willing to do volunteer work and, you know, make do with less and all of that, just stop. Like, you know what, I do three full-time jobs right now. I don't have any idea how many different jobs Aaron and Lolita do. When Lolita left as a, she was a, Lolita was a support staff person at um, the institution where I am. And when she left, we hired two full-time faculty to take on her workload. So like assert your boundaries and like know your value. Um, it's hard, but it's important. No is a very important word. Um, and really, really use it to your best advantage because sometimes you're not going to be allowed to say it. So when you can, it's really important that you use it. Like just following up on what Nikki says, part of my job description has as assigned by the dean. Like there's this huge little paragraph in my contract that says duties as assigned. And so the way you balance that is, is I actually tell my dean, okay, tell me what to drop. Because contractually, I have a certain workload. If you're adding something on for me, these are the things that I think I can drop. Tell me which one. And I make him choose because there is only so much you can do in a day. And like I said, I'm very privileged. I'm in a unionized tenured position. And that's very different from someone that's working at a staff level at a university archive or any other type of archive, especially government archives. But you figure out the politics of your workplace and figure out how to use your no, because you need to. That kind of brings us to another set of questions um, that I'm gonna go ahead and put in the chat. Um, that was all about how do you maintain work-life balance? So when I was at UNC, um, I realized I needed work-life balance because I'd heard on the news about something called the harvest moon. Now, my day should have ended at five when we closed down, but I saw the harvest moon rise and I was like, you know what? I don't think I need this. And so it was a slow process, but I started to set boundaries to say, no, I shouldn't be here at seven o'clock doing something because somebody else thought that they could push something onto me, not realizing that there are five things that I'm juggling. And so I've learned, it, it still took me a few years, but like Aaron and Nikki have said, no is a complete sentence. And you have to be a person who sets those boundaries because if not from the top, what's gonna happen is it's going to be a thumb on you. And, and so you're, at 10 o'clock at night, um, working on a project when you should be at home resting because at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning, you have five meetings to begin your day with. And so what happens is you become burnt out and you either leave the profession or you don't give your 100% because you're exhausted. And that is not, that's not a sustainable me uh, measure of anything. But you have to set those boundaries or somebody else will set them for you. And they're not going to care about any of your time. When um, when Lolita and I were co-workers, they instituted, so we, I was faculty, she was staff. They instituted a new timekeeping system so that the state could audit time and all of this. And that's when people started to realize how much work Lolita did because she was doing social media live at home 
in the evening, I would get text about like checking grammar or whatever, or like approve this because we had an approval process. So there were days that it would be like 10 a.m. on a Friday and Lolita would be like, I'm sorry, Nikki, you're going to have to handle this meeting because I hit 40 hours al already. And it's not what the timekeeping was set up to do, but it did hilariously enough point out how much work this person was doing, how many hours over the required that they were putting in. Um, so sometimes the university or whoever institutes things that they think are going to make sure you work 40 hours and all it does is, you know, catch the way that they're exploiting you. Um, early in my career, I did, in my last position, I was a professional staff employee at a University of Texas system school, and we did not have a promotion process and we did not have any requirement that we do professional development and scholarship. We had to do continuing education. So any scholarship I did, I, I would do some on the clock, but I would do plenty off the clock and in my own time. In this current position, scholarship is required. Um, it's part of my annual goal. I need it for promotion. I need it for continuing reappointment to my position. I do it all on the clock. I don't take home research. I don't write annotated bibliographies for articles. I don't design surveys with you know coworkers or do committee work at my, at like off the clock. Um, that's really one of the only ways that I've figured out how to sort of um, have a work-life balance. My ADHD means that I generally try to just like capture that, that like executive function when it happens and go with it. Um, but it does mean I, you know, if I do something at 10 PM, um, I'm not going to, I'm maybe not going to sign in the next day until, you know, later in the day to try to kind of balance it out. Um, because yeah, your your boss won't mean to do it always, but they will try to get as much out of you as they can. Yeah, I'm in that odd position where I only report leave time, which means I get nasty grams from HR every year because I have too much leave. Um, and some of that is just that I only learned how to say no when COVID happened. <laughs> unfortunately, where I was kind of forced to slow down and take a break because we didn't have reference room hours. But I had to get a dog to find work-life balance, a dog that's super high energy that needs to be on a long walk every day. And so it forces me to take breaks. It forces me to stop. And some people like me need that external reminder, right? For our other people, their parents, <laughs> that's built into their child. But like, I had a very poor example of work-life balance growing up because my mother's a doctor. She's on call all the time. There is no such thing, right? So I need external stimulus to remind me to stop, you know, go home, do something fun, take a break. Like Nikki, service and scholarship are part of my job requirements. So I have to do that same balancing act because I'm not, I don't have a time clock I report to. I have to think, well, I'm doing this, this is service, this is work. So for this, I took off at four from my job today because I was making up the hour later. But that's something you have to learn how to do. And it's not easy because it's so easy. I'll just read one more article. Oh, I need to, um, I need to, you know, edit the thing before I turn it into my publisher, so on and so forth. But that's something I, I am now a mentor to new faculty, and that's something I really push with them. Just because you're not tenured doesn't mean you have to go beyond 40 hours. I don't care what the dean told you about a 60-hour week. That's not how our contract is written, and you don't have to do it that way. But some people like me need that external reminder, whether it's a partner, a group of friends that are really supportive and are checking in on you and saying, did you actually stop? I've had friends do that for me, um, the dog, whatever. Find what works for you and put those limits on yourself because no one else is going to limit you. They're just going to take from you. And to add on to that, I was thinking about when I had transitioned from one job to the other. And <clears throat> it was just kind of like this thing that kind of made it more clear why I should move from one place to the other. Um, there was a question of 60 hours where... Um, I was moving from being a paraprofessional to a professional, and I had one, I had my current boss, well, at the time, um, tell me, well, you know, it's not like you're a paraprofessional anymore, you're going to be a professional, so you're going to have to work 60 hours or more, I mean, it, it is a thing, and then 
not even like a week later, I met a potential boss and she said, well, you know, it's, it could be 60 hours. It could be 40 hours. I think that you should work from home on certain days. And I think you should um, take the time to set those boundaries. And it was like a breath of fresh air because I didn't have to prove going from paraprofessional to professional. I didn't have to prove my worth. I mean, I was already doing the job of a professional, had the degree. I just didn't have the job title. But to see how those two um, supervisors looked at how they treated their staff, it was an easy decision for me. And I, it was a choice that I'm so glad I made. Somebody in the chat asked, how do you respond to that? And I'm going to assume that they're asking how Lolita or how do you respond to an, an employer or a boss telling you you need to work that you're you know expected to work 60 hours. Um, you're not. I mean, it's not in my contract that I do that, right? So I, if, if she's talking about who I think she's talking about, that was my boss too. And when I started the job, she was like, okay, so you know, you'll work nine to 10 hour days and you'll take a 30 minute lunch. But you don't need to clock in or, you know, like, we don't clock in or clock out as faculty, but some days you'll have a longer lunch and it'll all wash out in the end. And I'm like, you're asking me to work 45 hours a week and hope it balances out with the assumption that somehow I'm just naturally not going to be tasked with enough to do another 40 hours the next week. And so you, I mean, yeah, you just have to like build that relationship or figure out what your level of assertiveness can be. I mean, it's okay if you just secretly don't do the thing um for a little while for a little while until you figure out how you want to word it or you know reach out to other people to help you figure out how to say the thing there's like there's a great i don't know if it's an instagram or tiktok account where you know somebody turns in the you know turns what you want to say into professional lingo right you look for examples of how to word that email um in the past six months, there's all been all of this stuff about quiet quitting, which is literally just exerting your boundaries and doing the job you were hired and are paid to do. Um, that's that's just that's I mean, honestly, I think that that's part of like being being an adult and making sure that you don't um, burn out. Uh, yeah, I think I think with the pandemic, it really um, showed like because I remember um working at 10 o'clock at night and I'm thinking why am I sending an email at 10 o'clock and it's not giving me any kind of joy I'm going to have to be up and doing things in the morning I, and so then it became I remember and this is for Angel, Angela Lansbury I remember at three o'clock on a day I said that's it I'm looking at bed knobs and broomsticks because I've had five meetings five days in a row I'm quitting and then I set boundaries. If I have three, if I have more than three meetings in a day, I'm done for the day. No more Zoom meetings. And even like, because I was going through meetings, doing my work, plus 10 other like jobs. And I had to say no. And I had to like have a conversation. And a conversation, like Mickey said, it, it, it takes time because I know we're probably, a lot of us are introverts. Um, and it's hard to say no. And going back to what Nikki said too, don't let vocational awe make you feel like you have to. Don't feel obligated to prove that you belong in a space. Screw that table, flip it over and create another one. But it's, uh, and, and that's just basically just building up to that. Just saying no, again, complete sentence. Or being like, thank you for doing that. But again, what Erin said with her boss, I have all of these tasks, which one should I not do in order to complete? And sometimes that takes time and you're, you're in school now, you can actually do that right now and start building that up. Someone asked, um, do workplaces have a better understanding of this with COVID? I think individuals do. I think organizations, universities, entities do not. Yeah, I'm Nikki Froze, yeah. so I'm going to jump in. I think I don't that, I think they understand how much work they get out of me when I sit at home in this on this sofa and work because there's no divide. There's no work life divide, and and I stayed home. I worked from home and stayed full time remote for a year longer than any of my colleagues due to um, you know complicating health issues and, a, and an autoimmune uh, diagnosis and. You have, yeah, that's where I think that's when I started. Like, I'm forming to my sofa, and I that's when I started realizing 
actually, it's going to be better for my work-life balance if there's some days I just shut the office door behind me and hit the grocery store on the way home or, you know, go pick the kid up, you know, from, um, from after school care or whatever. Um, and it's, yeah, it's the remote, the, the understanding of that is not coming. Like, you know, at the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of, you know, discussion like, oh, now, now that, now that folks with disabilities have all these options available that they didn't have before. And now there, there are all of these, there's captioning and there's, you know, people that are understanding Zoom. And, and I mean, I feel like people are just like, we're done. It's over. You know, I, and one of the weird oddities that still masks at my job, most of the librarians in my department do, um, but we're not allowed to ask people to mask. We're not allowed to use COVID as a reason to not come in or not do a thing that's required of us. So um, it is difficult. Um, I know there are, are I know there are remote only jobs. We had um, our digital production librarian gave minimum two weeks notice recently. Um, because of the lack of work-life balance that she was getting at our position, and she works for the University of Miami, but she lives in Charlotte. Her contract states that she has to visit campus, I think, four times a year. She'll fly down to Miami. Um, so yeah, there are jobs out there. Um, I, I'm kind of locked in Charlotte, so I haven't really been looking at the job market lately. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know people fleeing places that are not accommodating for places that are. That's a good segue, Erin. I was just gonna say, you don't have to be blatant about it. I think Nikki hit on this a little bit earlier, but um, there are subtle things you can do to protect your work-life balance. And some of that is just leaving when you're done. You know, it's not, volunte it's not voluntary, right? When the room is silent and you feel that oppressive feeling of someone has to do it, so it might as well be me, no. <laughs> you know, so there are subtle ways you can do it when you're not ready or you don't feel like you have that relationship with your supervisor to say no. There are those little things that you just leave when it's time to leave. You don't volunteer, period, for anything. You just do your job and do the things you enjoy and get through the things you don't. But it's things like that that are subtle while you're building your confidence. And one of the things I did through COVID is that our, maybe the president of the university or the provost at the time was like, hey, it's time to get back to work. The HR manager in the library was like, no, keep remote an option because people are so much more efficient with the new schedules that they have. The flexibility is key to keeping our staff and our faculty. I work eight to one in the library and 2.30 to 5 at home. I spend an hour and a half with my dog walking in the afternoon. And when I need to be at work doing things with physical materials, I can. But there's a lot of stuff I can do from home as a digital archivist, especially because we finally got eSpace. So I have a remote connection and I'm good to go. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, manuscripts archivist and I'm in charge of our environment and our climates and our storage conditions and processing and technical services and I worked from home for two years I didn't go into the office for two years except for one day for like a filming event in our reading room and it wasn't a problem like it didn't impact our ability to do stuff I would still do donor pickups we did have somebody on staff who didn't want to work from home um it has, you know, post-COVID, post it's not post-COVID, post them making us come back to work and pretend it and gaslighting us into thinking COVID is over. Um, our library has negotiated two work from home days. Um, only one is guaranteed. The other they can take back or force you to force you to work on if they need you or something. Um, so I, I do... I do, I do, I split my week and I just make sure my calendar is current. Um, so I think that is really, that's the switch, right? So a lot of us are not getting to stay full-time remote, um, but there's intense pressure to accommodate some of it. Um, so I'm just going to ask um, from the section three questions, because you guys have already touched on the remote work uh, really well. Um, I was wondering if there's opportunities for digital archivists for international work. 
I actually went to Beijing um, my third year at a sec two and a half, three years um, to talk about online archiving. We had a special relationship with a university over there uh, and they were super into it. The translators were great. So the audience understood what I was saying. The interpreters were awesome. Um, but I think what most Americans don't really understand is that each country, no matter how similar we think our work is, has unique systems. So if you want to work internationally in a remote capacity, you actually have to really learn that country's record keeping the theories and practice, because how Canada does it is very different from how the U.S. does it. How Australia does it is very different from Britain. And that's really not something you understand until you read their literature, you go to one of their conferences, or you kind of sit in. So even though some of our theories and practices transfer, the way we think about archives and the ethics of it don't, because archives are so culturally specific. And we're coming to learn that more and more. And there's been such great literature about this in the past, I would say, 10 years, especially as we're talking about the people that have been left out in this country from archives. Um, the cultural basis of what builds an archive and what is recorded is so different country to country that you have to really understand that culture before you can do it justice working, even if it's remotely. All right, I want to ask uh, one more set of questions and it was really about like, what um, does an archivist do all day? Um, do you spend a lot of time with um, interacting with students or patrons? Do you spend um, time like developing systems um, or do you spend a lot of time with um, on computers, with manuscripts, with objects? What's your day-to-day -day life like? Meetings, lots and lots of meetings. So many meetings. Uh, here is a little bit different and I'm learning. Um, I've had the uh, honor of having to create two positions. So I get to decide what I what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when I was at Emory, um, I would literally have five meetings a, a day. Um, I would create a script for a podcast. I would create a Zoom webinar. Um, um, uh, just to create that in a month to have the actual program, go over questions for that, book people for that event, and do a two-hour desk shift. And that would be day one. Day two would be meeting with a donor, meeting with a, a nonprofit group, and also working on um, social media posts. Here, I'm learning um, more about the story archive that they've done, trying to find ways that where the first two years it was done online and now that we're in whatever we're in, because like Mickey said, it's not post-COVID in this, I don't know, wherever we are in this world. <laughs> uh, in 2022, um, we're now being able, we're now able to talk to people person to person. So what does that mean? Where they'll take the protocols. And then like today, I just got back from a conference that I presented at so I was talking to travel about how to do that because we're all traveling again and there's new systems and figuring out what does that mean and then gearing up for the next event. I'm working on another podcast at UNC, trying to figure out at, at Emory to wrap up that one. Also doing like two hours out on a desk. So yeah, that's my day today. It's chaos and I love it. <laughs> I spend a lot of time with spreadsheets um, me and Excel are friends again after a long time. We recently, or I recently, um, flippantly remarked that if our systems, university system staff couldn't support archive space, that we should seek hosting. Um, and yeah, I guess our university is moving from open source to all vendor hosting because they approved it. So I, um, kind of shepherded that transition, which is, which means that we have an updated version of archive space for the first time in three years. And so I've been doing a lot of like, um, legacy ingesting during this work from home period. I 
prioritized a thing that I've been putting off for five years and, and developed a workflow for um, utilizing archive space to manage our oral history interviews. So all of our oral histories are ingest, I mean, are accessioned into a space. Um, and so I've been doing legacy cleanup from an old database, which is tedious and mind numbingly boring, which probably explains why the other day, you know, I was wearing overalls that fit like every accoutrement I needed in the front pocket and took it upon myself to reprocess a collection because I couldn't find a folder because everything was mayhem and it had been processed by like an intern from like the Office of Student Engagement or something. And I was just like, forget it. Today, I'm like classic archivist and just spread some stuff out on my tiny little desk and tried to reprocess a collection. Um, I am back to working desk shifts for the first time in five years. I hate it. It's such a weird disruption into the way my brain thinks throughout a day, but um, it's good because we have a lot of folks that are not back in the office. Um, I meet with donors, so, I, so you know, so I'll have a whole half day where I go into some somebody's old super crowded craftsman home that you know there's a room that I'm digging through file folders in, and they call it the cat room because it's got like multiple litter boxes in it, and you know, so. Um, but I love that. I love that I don't like that I'm not on campus every day. Um, and then I get to work with the donors that we're getting the materials from and I get to go back to their house and pack it up. And I can always, you know, email them and ask them questions about the arrangement that I can pass on to, you know, the students doing the inventorying and things like that. Um, so yeah, my day does not actually have as many meetings as, as a community outreach person like Lolita. <laughs> we have a community outreach archivist as well. And Adriana's days are just solid meetings. I've seen her calendar, it's scary. I think the question is, what does an archivist do in a week? <laughs> because every day is different, right? Um, in a week, I have at least two desk shifts, which are typically two and a half hours because we only do two in a day because we have shortened hours. I do reference, I do desk shift backup because like I said, we're a small shop. So if someone has to retrieve something, it's me, <laughs> you know, I... If I'm working with a donor, it means I get to dive into their old computer, which is a lot more fun <laughs> for me than a cat room. So I'm resurrecting files from, you know, a Mac or a PC, or I'm on campus resurrecting files for a class that knows I exist and is like, God, we lost all our data. That happened with the anthropologists more than once. I have taught them and taught them, and yet, no, I'm still going to resurrect their old files. Um... I'm doing instruction across campus about electronic file management. I'm producing workflows for systems. And I truly mean that in the large sense, like processing workflows, things like that. I'm training students, or I have my little intern who has grown into an adjunct archivist now, and I'm supervising her meetings, all the meetings with service and with just administration in the library and campus-wide. Um, community wide, it just no one emphasizes how much it, how important it is to connect to your community. And we have some great new positions with like Lodita's. We don't have one of those at UN, you know, UM. So it's like building those relationship on the sly. It's like, hey, can I talk to you about what we have? And probably that's not culturally appropriate. And how do we fix it? That's what we're doing, right? And we're like Nikki said. Like, our relief structure is going in the back and processing. Like, everybody thinks you get to play with old paper all the time, unless that's truly your job, and very few institutions, unless they're huge, just have processing archivists. That's your, like, fun time. That's your, like, I get a break, I'm going to take, a, I'm going to, like, hoard this collection for myself and process it. <laughs> you're doing data migration, you're transitioning, like, I had, COVID was our A-space transition. I was like building programs to make our data safe for users, basically. So and while and your job will be so different in a week, but it will also be, I'm thinking like how different my job was. I started this position as seven years ago, how different my job is now than it was then, because we now have a community engagement archivist. We have an instruction archivist that we didn't have before. I was on the committee to hire a digital archivist. We have a university archivist who believes in finding aids. That's not what we had before. Um, you know, so like I used to do personal digital archiving outreach to activists and art artist communities. I don't, that's not really a component of my job anymore because there's other people kind of filling those roles now. So not only do you get to negotiate immediately, immediately around you with what you do and don't like, I mean, God, you don't want to manage local documents when they write the description for the new digital archivist, because all local documents are online now, 
Just have them put that in the, and their job responsibilities. You know, so if you're there long enough, you get to shape how your job progresses because you're shaping the way that responsibilities are kind of divvied up amongst your colleagues. I only laugh about the local documents is because I developed that system as a fellow and Nikki wanted nothing to do with it when we transitioned out because it was so cumbersome. So I'm glad she got to pass that over to someone else. I did. I took it on and then I gave it to him and we just use archive it now. I want to note the time and um, not take up too much more. I really appreciate um, all three of our panelists for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lolita. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Nikki. Um, after talking about all of the um, demands on your time, I really <laughs> want to thank you for volunteering to be with us tonight and um, for the content and um, the really um, open um, sharing about what the realities of archival careers are. Um, yeah, thank you. This was a fantastic discussion. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming and to everyone who submitted questions. Um, we had a great conversation. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing people at our next event in November. Um, that will be um, learning about the SEMA archive at UC Santa Barbara. What's Mara? Somebody asked about it in chat. That's just, this is not me trying to extend this, but what is the Mara Academy at your university? So we have the option of doing the um, library and information science or the archives something and records administration. <laughs> yes. Uh, masters, <laughs> yeah, yeah, records and administration. Okay. Yeah, no, that ML MLIS is accepted everywhere just take those Mara electives. Um, most everyone is going to ask for an accredited, ALA accredited degree. And I don't know if ALA accredited accredits Mara degrees, but I would check that. 